Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, sir. Democratic presidential candidate 2020, Seth Moulton. Welcome, sir. Hey, Seth, what's it's happening? Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know, I haven't heard any presidential candidate except uh, Tim Ryan discuss mental health issues, and then Mayor Pete started talking about it, and you started talking about it. Why Why isn't it more of a conversation when we know it's affecting so many Americans? Well, look, I don't, I don't know. I was actually the first in history, the first presidential candidate, presidential candidate in American history to not only talk about mental health, but share my own story. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's really important because people need to know that even folks running for president deal with mental health. That's, that's leadership by example. To be fair, I've been in politics for like five years and I didn't have the courage to share this before. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been, you know, worried about the political consequences. But what I talked about was my own experience with post-traumatic stress coming back from Iraq. Mm -hmm. I was in the infantry, I fought in the front lines. Uh, the story that I decided to tell, which is one of a few that have haunted me from that war, was pushing north of Baghdad in 2003. Uh, I was in the first company of Marines to invade Baghdad. And I was a platoon commander leading troops on the ground. And we came to this car that had been shot up by the Marines just ahead of us because they thought it was uh, Saddam's special forces heading south. They were they were up ahead. And now, we did you give the order them. to shoot up the car, or somebody else gave the order to shoot no, up the car? No, it, it was it was Marines just ahead of us, and there mm -hmm. were a lot of there were a lot of enemy soldiers heading our way. But this one particular car was a family that mm -hmm. just got caught up in the the violence. They had no idea. Which which people don't ever see in war. When you hear about these drone strikes in wars, families, kids, women getting killed. Innocent people. I and tell he, you by what, the way, we, my co-host hates you for this story. I just said I hate him. I, I just said I wanted to talk to him about it, but go ahead. No, look, you. I mean, look, we do everything we can to prevent this from happening, but this is the nature of war. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember thinking this is the first time that I really came face to face with the just utter brutality of war. Mm -hmm. And the parents were obviously dead in this car that had careened off to the side, but there was this, this boy, about five years old, five -year -old just boy. Mm -hmm. lying in the road, still alive, writhing in pain. And Yikes. when... When my platoon came to him, I made one of the most difficult decisions I've ever made in my life, which was not to stop because we had to press the attack to keep to stop the entire battalion to take care of this boy would have endangered the lives of dozens, if not hundreds of Marines. And I knew there were medics coming behind me. But look, there was nothing I wanted to do more in my entire life that that moment than just stop and get out and take this boy in my my arms and try to save his life. That's yeah. got to be the most difficult thing, right? Because as a, as a, you're in the army, so you have to being. you have Basically to move off strategy. Too, yeah. I mean, you can't in, move it, off emotion. Not, you got to move off strategy. In the Marines, to be fair, Marines. Army, I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to move off strategy, not emotion. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, and that's what making tough decisions in this kind of environment is like. That's what you know. Those are the kind of decisions, by the way, that a commander in chief, president of the United States, ought to be able to make. But it was hard, and it was hard to live with. And there were days when I got home from the war that I couldn't, you know, get through 24 hours without thinking about that. That boy. Did the five year old make it? Did he make it? I don't know. He doesn't know. So you decided that you had to go to therapy. Now, what actually triggered that? Was it something, what, a specific day, or did somebody recommend to you you need to get some therapy? How did that happen? Yeah, so um, I was lucky I got to come back and go to, the, um, to school on the GI Bill, and I was talking to a guy who was in mental health, that uh, like a professor or something, who said I just sort of told him a little bit about this. I didn't tell him about the boy, but just some of the symptoms I was having. Bad dreams, sometimes I wake up in a cold sweat, mm -hmm. feeling just withdrawn, like not, not into the work, you know, not into the school or whatever. And, uh, and he said, you know, you should go to talk to someone. But one of the reasons, Angela, that it was hard to come to terms with this is that I know a lot of veterans who've come back and, and have worse symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I was like, I don't even know if I've got post-traumatic stress when, when here's a guy who's, you know, afraid to drive down the street because he thinks that the, a bomb's going to blow him up or, or is feeling suicidal. I've never felt suicidal. So it was hard to say, yeah, I need help too, and I've got this problem too. Um, but it changed my life because I went to therapy and, and now I can deal with this. Now I can choose a moment like right now when I talk about the boy, but I don't feel, feel haunted by him in the way that I did. And I think it's made me a stronger person, uh, a better leader um, to go through this. And also, by the way, I think it's a good thing that the first time that I have to make a ch decision that will involve the lives of young Americans... Um, and live with the consequences of that decision, won't be sitting in the Situation Room of the White House. And I'm the only no, candidate no. in the race who can say that. Did yeah, you get I, a lot of flack for that, for, for, say, for telling that story and not stopping to help the five-year-old boy? No. To be honest, I, I thought I might. It's one of the reasons why I was nervous about telling it. Um, 
But instead, what I've heard is people across this country come out and share their mental health stories as well. We've been doing some town halls mm-hmm. where we kind of we kind of focus on vets because I think vets can be a good example to everybody else. But I mean, I've had Vietnam vets come up and share stories, and they say, "I've been carrying this with me since the Vietnam War, and I've never told anybody this mm-hmm. story." And the hope is that veterans can be an example for everybody else. So I released a mental health policy that's the most ambitious program of any of any 2020 candidate. And it says three things. One, we're going to make annual mental health checkups as routine as annual physicals for everyone in the military, every veteran. Mm-hmm. You know, if if you go and get a physical, regardless of whether you're sick, you ought to be able to get your, you know, get your head checked out too. Absolutely. And by the way, learn some exercises, right? Like it's not just about dealing with your, um, dealing with yourself when you're sick. You know, you go to a doctor, he's like, well, okay, you're not sick, but are you, are you exercising? Are you eating right? Well, what about meditation? Meditation, you know, mindfulness. breathing exercises. Exactly. You should yeah. learn that from your from your doctor, and it should be routine. The second plan, the second part of the plan, is to make this routine for every high schooler in America too. So annual mental health checkups for everyone in high school. Same thing, whether you're sick or not. Mental health is out of control in high school right now. Kids afraid of getting shot every time they show up at school. Absolutely. We gotta we gotta deal with that and set an example. And then the third thing is five one one. 511 national hotline you pick it up no matter who you are veteran non-veteran anyone you you know feeling suicidal or just need to talk to someone you're going to get help for your mental health issue right away by the way there's uh the same you know when you talk about war and you're talking about the death and the shootings it's the same thing with brothers in the hood like they go through the same type of things every day they deal with the same kind of trauma the same type of PS- ptsd seeing yep. dead bodies seeing people get shot so i think that that those same type of outlets should be provided for them too that's absolutely right. And and look, I mean, I, I tell you, one of the reasons I wanted to come on the show is because I know you've been a real leader in, in that, in sharing your own story. Mm-hmm. And and frankly, it's people like you who have been in positions of leadership, positions of, of great respect, who have been willing to share stories like yours that helped inspire me. There, there were a lot younger Marines than myself who shared their stories of dealing with post-traumatic stress. Um, before I had the courage to share mine, and, and I've got a lot of admiration for that. Currently, is there any support for veterans when it comes to mental health? You know, there is, but it's just not enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a buddy who came back. He's done He's done pretty well. He's in my first platoon. We served together. Um, he said, he, he, he wrote me like a text a couple months ago. He said, for the first time in my life, I've, I've felt suicidal. Never felt suicidal before, but I really thought about killing myself this week, and so I called the VA. They called me back 48 hours later, and they said I could talk to a therapist in three months. Damn. Mm. And he's like, he's like, I'm thinking about killing myself tonight. What the hell is wow. three months going to do for me? Right. You know. Wow. So look, the 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 VA is doing the best they can, and there are some good stories too of people getting there, going there, and getting help. But too often, this is this is the story. I, I got another guy I served with, um, a real hero in the war. He was from Alabama, um, and uh, black man had grew up in a really tough circumstances down there. Came into uh, uh, my platoon and um, a kid from another kid from Vermont got hit by a grenade in the building that we were in, and um, and he goes really he's really messed up, and um, this guy James from Alabama he he put Ryan on his back, carried him through literally through machine gun fire that already killed a couple other guys, and um, and and saved his life, got him to safety, and when he came back he got out and he wanted to keep saving lives, so we went to nursing school and he got a job in an ER. So he was literally saving lives every single day. Mm-hmm. But look, he like you'd expect he was troubled by post traumatic stress, and um, and so we went to help. And the VA, I've heard this story so many from so many different people. The VA just gave him meds because they're like, we don't have anyone for you to talk to. You know, we don't have enough people, and um, and just took a lot of meds, prescription meds from the VA. And at the age of thirty, he died of a heart attack just taking the meds he was prescribed. Wow. What, what do you think about foreign policy? I mean, you've been overseas, you fought for the country, and you know Trump is talking about sending troops to Iran, and we're always sending troops places. What do you think about our foreign policy, especially under this president? Well, first of all, uh, Trump is the worst commander-in-chief we've ever had in American history. I mean, and this guy is fundamentally weak. I mean, let's not forget, he, he got out of serving um, himself in the Vietnam War when he was called up uh, by lying about his feet. Mm-hmm. All right. What do you mean and, lying about his feet? Well, he claimed he got bone spurs. You oh. know, he got some doctor to write some note that he had bone spurs, and it's you know, it's, mm-hmm. 
complete BS. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and you know what people forget? You know, I, I get the fact that not everyone agreed with you with the Vietnam War, and I get that the people protested and, and, and didn't go and all that. And, you know, look, I, it's free country. I, you know, I, I, I respect people's opinions. But when someone dodges the draft like that, it's not like there's some empty seat in Vietnam that just has Donald Trump's name on it. Mm-hmm. You know, someone went in his place. You know, I, I'd like to meet the American hero someday who went in Donald Trump's place. I, and I really hope that that he's still alive. Does he know he was replacing Donald? <laughs> no, I'm sure he doesn't know. Is there any reason for the U.S. to be invading Iran? No, absolutely not. And uh, in 2004, uh, I was back there. Um, that's actually where I was there with James. And uh, and, and we were in a pretty fight, tough fight in Najaf in, in southern Iraq. And there were Iranian soldiers who were coming and, and supporting that fight. So, I mean, we've literally fought Iranians on the on the ground there. I remember how accurate their mortars were. And um, and you know what? If necessary, hell, I'll fight Iran again. If I'm commander-in-chief and we need to go to war with Iran, I'll do it. But this is not necessary. Okay. This cool. is not necessary. We should not be going to war with Iran. And, and look at what happened in Iraq. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and, and you've got people in this administration like John Bolton is a national security advisor. He just wants to bomb Iran. And he's one of the same people who pushed us into Iraq under Bush. And the thing that Bush and Trump have in common is they both dodged serving in war. That means they got no credibility to say to these hawks, like, hey, we don't need to to go there. Does he have the authority, does Donald Trump have the authority to say, okay, we're gonna invade Iran without approval? No, not without Comte de He thinks he does. He can do it, though. He thinks he does. Well, that's the problem, is he, he, you know, like, if Congress isn't doing its job to hold him accountable, you know, we've been fighting to get some amendments passed to say, you know, just, we're gonna cut off the funding if you try to do this, but, you know, Republicans are scared of the president, and so, they don't. They don't want to. They don't want to support that. And, but and it wouldn't be the first time a president has gone to war without Congress's approval. No, that's right. Well, the Vietnam right. and Iraq, right? Well, I think that there's a lot of parallels with Vietnam here because I think the hawks, like 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 Bolton, Pompeo, what they're trying to do is get us into a situation where there's just some something, you know, some firecracker, you know, sets off, and we're like, oh shit, you know, we got to respond, and and that could get us into a war. Mm-hmm. And and Trump does not have the credibility to say, no, oh, we're not going to do this he's all over the map we he, he you know has no strategy whatsoever he says that he he pulled us out of the iran nuclear deal well that's done a lot of good because now iran's building a nuclear weapon he's got no replacement for the deal um he's got people in his administration who are starting trying to start a war he approved airstrikes and then he pulls back i mean this is american lives that are going to mm-hmm. be at stake here right. not just twitter mm-hmm. this isn't just twitter mm-hmm. this is american lives that are at stake and also by the way when the drone when, when our drone got shot down now we've basically had no response, which basically says to Iran, you can keep shoot, keep shooting down our aircraft because we're not going to do anything. Let me say it was discrepancy. They, Iran, they said it was on their territory. We're saying it was in in in, in a safe space. So it, it was so many different. Well, I'll tell you what, just release the radar tracks. Let's see the radar tracks. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to see. We can prove it. You think she's trying to start a war because they always say it's hard to not reelect the president when when the country's at war? Look, I, people say, oh, if Trump himself doesn't really want a war. But I'll tell you what he's much more concerned about than a war, and that's looking weak. This is a mm. guy who mm. he didn't he didn't care about American lives. If he cared about cared about American lives, he wouldn't dodge his dodge the draft. You know, mm. this is a guy who doesn't care about anything but his image, and we all know that. I mean, I think people, you know, a lot of people who vote for him, they understand that about him too, and um, that's why this is so dangerous. Is there yeah. any truth? Is there any truth to people starting wars just so they? A sure re-election, basically. Look, I think so. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't. I know as well as. I mean, I can't prove it. I mean, we. I know it as bad as well as you guys, but like, I mean, I think so. I think this guy would do that. Mm -hmm. Um, That's how vain he is. When did you decide that you needed to run for president, and why? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, I knew I couldn't make this decision. There was a lot of people who encouraged me to run, all that, but and I looking at it, but um, I knew I couldn't make this decision until after I knew what it was like to be a dad because. I just had a my first my first child, a daughter, born in October. Congratulations! Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's, uh... What took you so long to take your condoms off, bro? What's wrong? What's up with you, man? You know, I don't know. It took me a while to get married too, but uh, me too. But I've got an amazing wife, <laughs> and uh, and now an amazing daughter, mm-hmm. and uh, and you know, I mean, it's yeah, it's like a like life changing experience, like everyone says. Um, but I've learned two things in the first few months of being a dad. Uh, one. I cannot believe how much I miss this girl that I just met. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of people in my life much longer than my daughter Emmy, but um, I miss her to death. I'll be away for a day, and I can't. You know, I just was telling my, just texting my wife to send pictures this morning. But the second thing is that I'm even more invested in this job and the future of the country because it's her future now too. And 
you know what? I want her to grow up someday and look back and say her dad did everything he could to beat Donald Trump. I was going to ask, too, if, if you had a child at the time, going back to the thing, and the five-year-old, do you think you would have had a, a different view of the, of the five-year-old laying, laying there, if you, if you think you would have had a child at that time? I don't think it would have been... I don't think it would have been different. I don't think it would have changed my decision right there. But I'll tell you what, um, I think that going through this and thinking about that that boy, um, I mean, I think about that experience now as a dad, mm -hmm. and uh, and I, th I think it actually makes me a better father because mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I really got to take care of this girl. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, you, don't, about... you don't really know what true love is until you have kids. Right. Like, even love for your significant other. Well, this could get me in big trouble. It's with the truth, life, though. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a totally different feeling. I mean, you're mm -hmm. so devoted to this, uh, um, you know, to this little child. It's um, it's it it's amazing. But it makes you like like for me because I know that the job I'm in can really you know potentially affect the future of the country. Right. Like it's it makes me much more. And it'll, it'll make you love your wife more though because you have your kid and you know oh, what yeah. love is. So you know that feeling. So when you start feeling that for your significant other, you like wow. Well, and also you see what your wife goes through. Mm -hmm. And yes. I mean, I you know. I mean, I, I, I had a, a surgery at the VA a few years ago. It's a story I sometimes tell when talking about healthcare because not everything went according to plan, you know, and people got to know this about, you know, single payer healthcare because that's basically, I'm the only candidate in this race who gets single payer healthcare because I've made a commitment to continue going to the VA. Anyway, point of the story is I had this, um, you know, this scar um, on my abdomen that I thought was like, you know, pretty serious and it, it, you know, hurt a lot and I had to take all these meds and everything. Um, and then my daughter's born and my wife has a C-section. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was not a big deal. That was a real <laughs> thing. <laughs> that wasn't a big deal. <laughs> and when you think about having a daughter, I'm sure it also makes you think about women's rights. Yeah. And then we also see these women who are coming forward, over 15 women talking about Donald Trump and sexual assault and just even recently, you know, recounting their experiences they've had with Donald Trump. So why do you think it feels like he's been so untouchable in this time where we are so involved with making sure that men are being held accountable? I mean, look, he's just changed all the rules and anything that would have. I mean, can you imagine if there was even just one um, accusation like that about President Obama? Mm. He'd be in I jail. Mean, oh, over. He's, he's a black man. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, seriously. I mean, yes. that, charges that, would be pressed. Right. Right. And uh, and yet, I mean, we're not even barely talking about it. I mean, this is the first interview all week that someone's just brought it up with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is. Um, this is a whole new level of screwed up. And it's alarming because she is doing interviews and he's just like, I don't know her and she's not my type. And it's crazy that you could just say something like that and people are still supporting him and women are still supporting him. Well, and it's not like it's just one accusation, right? right. This is like number 15, 15, 16 or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, it's it's totally out of, it's out of control. I mean, this is just how, um, how morally corrupt uh, this man is. And uh, and that's why in this race, like, I'm not afraid to confront him. I mean, I'm taking him on in his job as commander in chief. You asked about foreign policy. That's actually where he's weakest. Mm -hmm. You know, getting us into wars, cozying up to people like Putin and the guy in North Korea. Um, I mean, this guy is a dangerous, he is a totally unpatriotic American, and we got to confront him there. We also got to talk about just what it means to to have some morals and, and moral mm -hmm. leadership in the, in the White House, because that is totally gone. Mm -hmm. And then we haven't even begun, start, started to talk about, like, the other news this weekend, which is what he's planned to do with immigrants, right. you know, literally round them up and round up families and uh, and 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 deport them as if, like, you know, talk about caring about kids. I mean, this guy has, you know, got no morals whatsoever. Now, Bernie Sanders said he's going to get rid of all one point six trillion dollars of student loan debts. <laughs> So and, just, and you're gonna what, pay what for you, all that. Yeah, do, you, what, do you believe that? <laughs> do you believe no. that? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> I mean, that's a problem. You know, you can get out there and like say these like big, big promises that are never gonna happen. And look, you're not being honest with the American people. There's no way. There's no way in hell Congress would ever gonna. He pass said he's that. gonna take 05 percent from Wall Street, and that's gonna cover 1.6 trillion of the student loan debt. Do you have? And by the way, where does that leave everybody who doesn't go to college? Right. I mean, half America doesn't even go to college. Mm -hmm. So. You know, you could, with that kind of money, you could literally wipe out poverty in America for like, I think it's five or six years, something like that. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Think about wow. that. Now, look, I'm all, I'm all for, like, I, I get the fact. I mean, I'm sitting here running for president and I still got school loans. Okay. So, <laughs> you like, you still have so, school loans? Yeah. yeah. So, so I get Why do you still have school loans? Because I, because I'm like trying to pay him off, man. Because I didn't come from, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I want you, you to know. do more with your life, son. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for his credit also. They have those payments made every month. Jeez. But like, so like, I get it's a problem and it's a problem for a lot of Americans. I don't want to minimize it. Like, I'm going to do things to help them too. Like, I mean, my policy is if you have school loans for more than 30 years, they get, wi they get wiped out. <laughs> yeah, okay. 30 like, years. Like, that's, that's, that's too long, you mm -hmm. know? 
and, well, and you're never going to pay more than 10% of what you earn for your school loan. So, like, there's a policies here that it'll help. Mm -hmm. But just just in one, like, just pretending that we're going to wipe out everybody's debt. And and not, what about all the people who don't even get a chance to go to college? Right. What about the people who want to go to vocational school? What about school? if you can't afford to pay your student loans? That that gets wiped out, too? Cause if you can't afford? If you can. Like, I'm not going to pay say, them. If I know they're going to get wiped out. I mean, if you can afford to pay them, they'd be well, paid, right? If, if, I mean, that's the thing is, like, some of these people were gonna are doing pretty well, and they're going to get they're gonna get free money. And, and, you know, that money doesn't grow on a tree. Like, it comes from somewhere. How much do you owe, that. Seth? How much? I, I only, I'm really getting low. Like, but you go like, pay it off for like like five thousand bucks left. You got him, Sean. Yeah. You cheap bastard. Yeah, no. Pay the goddamn money. <laughs> so you gonna take it out brain. of his campaign money? Hey, every month, every month, every month, I write my check. You know, you you're only even, gonna wait, you're only on. gonna get as much. Hold on, you write a check a every month, but you don't have a, like a direct be. payment. Oh no, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's auto. I was gonna like, say, come on, you auto. can't still be writing checks and. No, 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 I'm not literally writing a check. Yeah, fair. Yeah, that's fair. Let's take a little bit of your campaign money, and that's illegal. That's illegal. So illegal. So illegal. By the way, it does not prevent some of my colleagues from doing it really oh yeah there was a there's a big story out in california about some guy who's like <laughs> using his campaign funds no he uses campaign funds to pay the tuition for his ki kid to go to school or something like really? that at a private school that sounds like karma a little bit though <laughs> oh like like the circle of life almost like i owe but i'm gonna get some money from y'all you know that's illegal well, that is illegal. What, it's, what, it's, yeah. now, what about it's growing so middle the, the middle class and, and small businesses it's, it's a lot it's it's very hard for minorities to get loans Almost it, difficult. Unbelievable. Almost impossible. Unbelievably hard. And there are a lot of people who can't even talk about getting a loan to start a business. There are a lot of people who can't even get a bank account. Right. So my plan is a lot of Americans who are, they, we call them unbanked. Like they just don't have a bank to go to. And that means they got to go get payday loans and everything. And they get, you know, the, the interest rates are out of control. Mm -hmm. So here's my proposal. The Postal Service, you know, they're not handling as much mail anymore. So we're going to introduce an additional service at the Postal Service at every U U.S. post office that is a, is a bank. It's like a public bank. It's sort of like having a public option in healthcare, like uh, like President Obama tried to tried to pass. Mm -hmm. So if you can't go to a private bank because they won't accept you, um, then you're going to go and have a, just basic banking services. Nothing fancy, you know, no no fancy metal credit cards or anything like that. But but you're going to be able to go to the post office and you're going to have a bank account that will just you know make a modest interest rate and 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 there won't be any cost associated with that. Like you're going to get just basic services, uh, checking account. I mean, I don't know. If, write checks or not but like <laughs> that but but you like just basic services and that'll help you build your credit also it helps you build your credit it helps you um just make sure you're not getting you know taken advantage of but all these payday loan uh, lenders and everything else i mean it, like frankly probably put a lot of them out of business but that's okay and uh and it means that you know if you're someone who just needs a second chance to start putting their life back together um you know, it's um, I see a lot of vets with this, too, because they come back, they get in a little bit of trouble because they got post-traumatic stress. Um, and, uh, and you know, they just need a little bit of help to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is. It's, it's criminal the way that we. Um, and this is, by the way, the statistics, I don't, you, go, you, go, you guys all know the statistics, but like it's so clear that there's just outright discrimination against people um, who want to get loans, mm -hmm. you know, want to want to want to start a business. Question. Business. Why, why does America treat its veterans like shit? Because nothing pisses me off more than when I see, you know, guys standing with the signs that say, I fought in Vietnam, and people just walk past them, won't even put no change in their cup. Like, I think that all veterans should never have to pay taxes ever again. They should get free room and board for the rest of their lives, and they should get, like, a stipend every month just to be able to survive, eat, pay their bills. Well, that works for me, but um, no, I'm, I'm joking. I mean, look, it's wrong. It's wrong, and I think the reason is fundamentally that you know there was a time in America when a lot of people served their country. There was a time in America when our political leaders actually asked Americans to serve. They actually got elected by saying, "I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to give something back," mm -hmm. rather than here I'm gonna give you all all this you know free stuff, and um, and and that's changed. Right. So people don't have this experience. You know, people a lot of people come up to me and they say like, "Hey, I support vets," but they just don't even know where to start because they don't even know what, what what being a vet is all like. There's vets getting deported even. There's fought for this country. I met with a house full of them in Juarez, Mexico, and there was this guy who had served in the Navy, um, served in the Navy for ten years, done a lot of great jobs, got honorably discharged, but then you know what? He had a drinking problem from the Navy, so he got a DUI, and he look, he's the first one to say it was wrong. He did his time. He did his time, and then he got out and he got deported. His parents are American citizens. His kids are American citizens. He doesn't. He didn't. He didn't been to Mexico since he was 16 years old, you know. And he didn't have any family or friends there or anything else. His whole family is in America. He served his country. He just didn't 
look, he just screwed up. He didn't bother to do the paperwork for his citizenship when he was in the Navy. Right. But now he's deported because of this this administration, because of Donald Trump. And and it's so messed up. But but I want to get back to your saying about just treating vests. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm, I'm I'm doing in this campaign is I've got the most ambitious national service uh, program. Now, this isn't expanding the military, but it's expanding opportunities to serve the community here at home. Programs like City Year, AmeriCorps. And here's the deal. If you serve your country for a couple years, we're going to help pay your education. So it's like a civilian version of the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that this will not only help people go to school, whether they want to go to college, vocational school, you know, skills academy, whatever it is, but also it will help bring Americans together. Because I served with such an incredibly diverse group of Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, people from all over this country, different skin color, different religious beliefs, different political beliefs. We all came together in the same platoon, you know, fighting on the front lines, and we had to put aside those differences to do what's right for the country. And look, we still got differences. Like, we, we get on Facebook every single day, and we mm -hmm. debate issues, and, 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 and they're not all the same. But we have so much more respect and understanding for each other. And I've got friends from parts of this country and from different backgrounds that I never would have even met if not for being a Marine. I want more Americans to have that experience. I don't think you should have to go into the military to do it. But here's the difference. Like I'm actually saying, I want you to serve the country. I want to, I want you to give something back to America, and that's how we're going to help pay for your college. But I think it's just such a slap in the face when you go to fight for this country, and then you come home and can't even, you don't even have a place to stay can't get a in job, this country. Can't do and, I, and, I, and I hated when like the, all the NFL protests were going on, and Donald Trump would uh, always call Colin Kaepernick unpatriotic. There's nothing more unpatriotic than having your veterans out here homeless. Nothing more unpatriotic. And you know what? Pa patriotism isn't about hugging the flag. Like, there's this picture of Trump hugging the flag, which mm -hmm. just makes me sick. Mm -hmm. Patriotism is actually fighting to make sure the flag stands for something. And whether you're Colin Kaepernick standing up for equality mm -hmm. or kneeling for equality or you're, a, you know, Marine soldier, whatever, serving overseas, like, that, that's, what, that's what real patriotism is. Donald Trump is not patriotic. He's unbelievably unpatriotic. Now, you didn't get gotta, invited. I'm sorry. We got to call that out. Now, you didn't get invited to the first two uh, debates tomorrow and then follow day. Yeah, that's right. Now, it, yeah, me and a couple others got excluded. Did it hurt your feelings? Oh, terribly. <laughs> you know, I, I had to get at the tissue and, you know, and, you know wipe my <laughs> eyes. And No, look, we actually had our biggest, uh, one of our biggest days in the campaign the day that they announced that, um, mm -hmm. that we weren't getting in. Mm -hmm. Because the DNC and the folks in Washington, they're not going to decide who is, who, who's the next nominee. Yes, they you know, will. The American they did people. it in 2016. Well, Some people say the primaries right, were rigged. Enough. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I think I, I hope we've learned a lesson. But look, they're trying to rig the primaries now in, in a lot of ways with their criteria. But but I'm not going to cry over it. I'm just going to just get out there and keep sharing my message with the American people. I was down in South Carolina this past weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, got an amazing reception. Um, got an amazing uh, state director who is a um, a Marine drill instructor, and uh, she's a black woman from South Carolina. Been involved in politics while you know she's just kicking ass down there and. Uh, we were really resonating on the ground. The message is resonating, um, and we've got great turnout. We're going to parts of the state that a lot of people don't visit, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. And it reminds me of the first race I got in um, when I was running for Congress, and I was running against the the establishment because I was taking on this 18-year incumbent, and there are a lot of people in Massachusetts who were like, Seth, you're not only going to lose this race, but you're never going to be involved in politics again because you dared to take on the Democratic establishment. And what they were saying to this young veteran was, do not participate in the democracy you just risked your life to defend. Mm -hmm. And that's so wrong. Ooh. That's so wrong. But that's kind of what they were saying to me, yeah. you know? And, um, I mean, talk about not taking care of veterans. Like, they are just like, don't even, you know, you, you, you've done your time overseas. We don't need you in our politics. Right. And I, I was I, like, we need this perspective in our politics. I want people to be in, in Congress who understand the consequences of, of, of fighting on the ground. I'm the, I'm the only one in this, in this whole presidential race. I know there are like 23 of us. But I'm the only one who's led troops in combat. Like, I think we're in the middle of the longest war in American history. There are still Americans mm -hmm. fighting in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq every day. Like, we got to have that perspective where we're making these decisions. Was the man Pete in the military? Or he didn't lead? Oh, didn't, yeah. Didn't, he, you know, he was in the military, but he, you know, was an analyst. So um, a little bit different than, than leading troops in the ground. I really respect his service. You know, mm -hmm. we need everybody to do different, uh, different things. But, but so much of this race is, is, is about how we can build the coalition, how mm -hmm. we can b bring Americans together to actually have enough votes to beat Donald Trump. That means everybody in our party, you know, we got to get everybody from different sides of the Democratic Party to come together. And then we got to win over those Obama Trump voters, you know, the people who voted for Obama, but then switched and voted for Trump. We got to get them all together. And that's the leadership experience that I had in the Marines, where you had this incredibly group, diverse group of Americans. You had to get them united behind a, behind a common mission. 
What about I people think that think that, you know, we go to war and fight all these other nations or we help all these other nations, but America's fucked up. You know, we still have bad water in Detroit. There's still so many different problems here, but we're so quick right. to help every other nation. Well, look, the reality is if you want to be if you want to be the leader in the world, you got to do both. You know, you just got to balance them right. It doesn't have to be one without getting... the other. You don't have to pick and choose. That's like, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we got to get the balance right. And right. I'm not sure we've always gotten that balance no, right. Right. I mean, we were spending way, you know, huge amounts of money overseas. I mean, trillions of dollars in Iraq in a war that shouldn't have happened. Um, and we're not taking care of things like poverty back home. We're not investing in our schools enough. You know, I mean, we, we live in a country that says it's equal opportunity, but we all know it's not equal opportunity. Right. You know, we all know that. Um, I used to always say that, you know, um, school, you know, opportunity is by zip code, right? Because if you're in a different zip code, you can go right down the street to your neighbor's town and you're going to have a totally different chance of life mm -hmm. in schools. And I was, uh, I was saying this to, a, as actually a women's fundraiser, a women's group. And, um, and this, um, this, this, this young black woman in high school stood up and said, you know, Seth, you always say that uh, education varies by zip code and you're right. But even within my own zip code, educational opportunity is not the same because all the white kids do better than all the black kids because they have mentors, because they have people to look up to. We don't have any black teachers. We don't have any black guidance counselors. We don't have any black role models um, because there's systemic dis dis discrimination just in our in our system and in our town. Mm -hmm. You know, she was making this point. I'm like, she's right. Like, that's a good point, you know? So, so whether you're looking city by city, state by state, or even just within a school, opportunity is not equal. And this is a country that promised, that's built on the promise of equal opportunity. So but that, that was a never, lot of work to do. That was never written for anybody other than yeah. other white, old white men, though. That's, well, that's, that's who wrote it. But It wasn't for women. It wasn't for minority, black mm -hmm. people. It wasn't for gays. That was for white people, but specifically white men. Yeah, that's how they wrote it. But you know what? <laughs> so what? We, we need to apply it to everybody. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of work to do. We right. got a lot of work to do. I was talking to Jim Clyburn down in South Carolina. He's been a... He, he was one of the people, when I first came to Congress, and everyone's like, I can't believe you won this election, mm -hmm. and you know we're all against you and everything. He immediately took me under his wing and was like, I'm going to help you out. And I've never forgotten that. And he's got this plan called the 10-20-30 plan, which yep. says that for any federal agency, 10% of the resources should be invested in the communities that have had a 20% poverty rate or higher for the last 30 years. And we owe that. Right. You know, That's what we should be doing. Remember after the... Um, and I was just reading about Reconstruction and how there was this proposal that the idea was former slaves were going to get promised 40 acres and a mule, mm -hmm. right? Never happened. Imagine, imagine what those 40 acres would be worth across the country right, right. now if, if they had gotten that and they'd been able to pass it down to their families and invest in that. So now what do we do moving forward? So we got to have a discussion about reparations. You know, do we got to have that discussion. Do you have a stance regarding reparations? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with Ta-Nehisi Coast, which is like you got to you got to get behind um, having this debate in public, in Congress, and deciding what we need to do. You know, where we need to invest in communities. Jim Clyburn always says that reparations is about like repair. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, it's not necessarily just writing a check, but it's investing. It's investing in the places where uh, Black people have been historically left behind. Do you think and, this reparations debate is a legitimate discussion or just a hot topic for this election? Because this is the dream selling season. So people are just saying everything that you want to hear. You know, four years ago, we were talking about uh, like a country that's yes, we can. Right. That was Obama's slogan. Oh, this guy, Trump, is all about no, you can't. Like if you're if you're a Muslim, you can't come here. If you're if you're if you're black, you can't vote. If you're a woman, you can't choose. I mean, I mean, he's literally. This is like the no, you can't presidency. So I actually think there's no more important time than right now to be talking about this. Right, and if people are saying these things, then you have to really hold them accountable. You can't just let it slide either. You, you got you got to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just you can't just say you know oh, you know sure I care about black people. Like what are you gonna do? Right. What are you gonna do? Why should we believe anything politicians say this time of year though? It's hard. It's hard, but you know what? That's what I want people to know about me. Like, I'm not, I'm not getting out there and just telling people what they want to hear. Um, what means the most of you? So my my greatest mentor in life. I mean, I would not be here if not for this man, Peter Gomes. Um, he was the minister of my college church, black man, um, and and we were close. He even wrote about me in one of his in one of his books, and um, he he was someone who always challenged you whenever you went to church. You know, he made you think. He made you a little bit uncomfortable. And I remember one day walking out of church and, and I went up to him and I said, hey, Peter, that was an amazing sermon. And he shot back. He's like, he's like, that just means you agreed with it. 
Mm-hmm. And his point was that you can't always just tell people what they want to hear. Mm. You got to push them a little bit. And a good sermon in church doesn't just tell you what you want to hear. It makes you think a little bit and think, okay, I got to I got to do things a little bit differently this week. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what he challenged me to do in life. Um, he challenged me to serve. That's why I decided to go into the Marines. I always pay attention to who people have on their team too. Like, who is it that you have supporting you? Who is it that are your confidence that you feel like, okay, I listen to this person, I trust this person, their ideals line up with some of my ideals, and that person will challenge me and expose me to things that I might not have thought about before. Totally. Like, I'm a huge believer in, uh, I'm a huge believer in just the value of diverse teams. Like, people talk about diverse teams like that's a talking point. No, it makes you smarter because you're going to get perspectives that you don't already, always get, always get. Now, let me tell you, one of the problems in politics is that if I just put out a job opening for my, my, my office in Washington, it's almost all white people who apply. Mm-hmm. Because, you know what, it's really expensive to live in Washington. If you want to be an intern, which is where you start, you can't even afford to, mm-hmm. to live there. So I just started this, um, this thing called the Congressional Fellows Institute, which basically just provides scholarships for um, minorities, people of color, to become interns. Because we need to start feeding the pipeline where people can apply for jobs as staffers, chief of staff, things like that, high level positions because they came into the system as interns. Right. And right now, like basically it's all white interns on Capitol Hill. So by the way, what do you think that means when they're, you know, doing research, giving advice to lawmakers like myself when it comes to making laws? Like we're just getting the white perspective. People are interested in their own interests. Also. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, even if we're like, you know, we're trying to get different perspectives. Like if you only have rich people working for you, mm-hmm. you're just never going to get the perspective of someone who um, comes from a different background, has had different challenges in life. So we actually have our first two fellows um, who started this year. We've raised the money. We've established this thing. It's like a nonprofit. And that's the mission is just to get more people from diverse backgrounds into politics so that those views are heard as well. Have you ever thought about what a reparations plan would look like? I think that it's probably, I've thought about it a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, look, I don't know what the answer should be. That's why we got to get, ask people who, because um, it's not going to affect me. Like we got to ask the people it's going to affect, right? But I think education has got to be a huge part of it mm-hmm. um, because that's truly investing in opportunity, you know? Finances. Um, hey, I think, I think we need finance, to, I, 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 whenever what I, do you think? Yeah, when I look at reparations plans, I'm not always use historical context. So I look at what Frederick Douglass proposed. I look at what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad proposed. And it was always some type of land. You know what I'm saying? So I just think it has to have something to do with land. And I think about all of us that are buying real estate and buying property. Like I just well, and housing is such a problem, right? Yeah, access to housing. Yeah, but yeah. I just think it has to be has to have something to do with land. I don't know something tangible that you can pass down. That won't and be taxed own. See, because they'll give you the land and then they tax it, and then ten years from now they take the land right back. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay, but you know I, I want to say this. Um, you know what scares me about 2020, yeah. 2016, and the fact that there was some fishy business going on with the DNC and the primaries because I, I feel like the Democrats cannibalized themselves. If Bernie was the guy that people were behind, that's who should have been up against Trump. But you play these establishment politics and it ended up being Hillary. How do we know that won't happen in 2020? And we had Tom Perez up here and asked him the same thing. And he could not say no, the DNC did not rig the primaries in 2016. Well, I mean, look, I mean, I, I'm not in the DNC. You know, I, I don't I mean, I'm not be honest with you. I don't know. I don't know that I can answer that question because right. I think we got to be be holding them accountable and we got to be vigilant. And uh, and that's why even though um, I'm not in the debate and there's a couple other people who aren't in the in the first debate, uh, you know, I'm going to go to Miami. I'm going to get on TV and I'm going to make sure people hear my message and hear what I'm about, all about and, and say to people, you know, um, the DNC should not exclude a combat veteran from from this debate process. We should hear that voice, too. And I think that's a fair position to take. Do you believe they did rig the primaries in 2016? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Absolutely they did. Yeah. Yeah. No how question. Can you, how can you trust anybody then? Because you got the Russians interfering in the general election. Democrats Look, this, is, in this, the, is the single, this is the single biggest problem right now is you can't trust anyone. I totally agree. And it's one of the first lessons that you learn when you show up for the military for training. I remember when I showed up, I didn't know anything about the military. I didn't even know the difference between a, a sergeant and an officer or anything. I was really clueless, right? Um, I just wanted to, to do my part. I show up and um, and you quickly learn that you can fail a test and they'll and they'll let you retake the test. You can drop out of a run and you know they'll probably let you try it again the next day. Mm-hmm. But if you lie about anything, you're gone that afternoon. Wow. You're gone that afternoon because that's how important trust is. I mean, you're, you're going to risk your life. You're going to count on the um, the man or woman next to you to risk your life. Like, you better be able to trust that person. So yeah, who do we voter, trust? And we can't trust, you can't, you can't trust the American you people. Can't, you can't trust anyone. I mean, you can't trust this president. 
You know, like I want to be. You can't trust Democrats either if they're doing stuff like that in the primaries. You know, the point is you got to find individuals you can trust, and that's yeah. the case I'm trying to make to America. Mm-hmm. Is you're not going to agree with everything I say. I'm sure people listening today are thinking like, there's some things he said that I don't agree with, but I, you, you got to be honest about where you stand. Do you think the electoral college is antiquated and we should? Oh have a come on! It, it, was, it was literally that was literally designed when they were you know counting um, blacks as three fifths of a person. Yeah. You know that's where that comes from. It's so ridiculous, and it, and it means that so many people who vote in this in this presidential election know that their vote doesn't really count. I mean, you, you guys vote in New York, yeah, like whatever, it doesn't matter who you vote for because New York's going to pick the Democrat, <laughs> right? So like some of you might not even show up to vote, and that's so wrong. I mean, a fundamental principle of a democracy is that every vote counts. Well, not if you not if primaries are being rigged and general nope. elections are being and rigged and gerrymandering, and there's still voter suppression going on, especially in the South. Right. You know, I mean, Stacey Abrams should be the governor of Georgia right now. Mm-hmm. She Andrew ran against, should be the governor of Florida. Governor of Florida. Um, you know, there there there's a race in in uh, North Carolina. A veteran I was supporting. They literally had votes stolen out of people's mailboxes. Like we thought we fixed that in like 1960, and it's still going on today. I, I've called for a new Voting right, Rights Act in America to inc- imp- improve and strengthen the one that that um, that we used to have, um, because we got to end this stuff. We got to end voter suppression. Um, we got to end gerrymandering. Mm-hmm. We got to end the electoral college so that everybody can vote in the presidential election and know that you know if Hillary Clinton beats Trump by three million votes, he's not going to be the president. Right. At this point, right now, what party? is more full of shit. The Democrats are Republicans. Republicans are way more full of shit. You know why? Because what they say in private about Trump is totally different than what they say in public. Mm -hmm. Because in private, they know that he's an idiot. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. It shouldn't matter what your party is. You should be able to call people out. Just be able to call people out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I got got some heat for for challenging our leadership, just saying, you know, hey, you've been there for a combined total of of, of 100 years. Like, we need to get some new voices in the party. We all this amazing freshman class. Like, we want to give them a chance to, to lead. You know, and people are like, oh no, no, you can't, you can't challenge, challenge. But, but you know what? It's okay if you disagree. Like, just get out there and and show where you stand. Like, have the courage to just say, this is where I stand. This is my, this is my position. It seems like Joe Biden's leading in the polls. What are your thoughts on him? Look, I mean, I, he's been a mentor and a friend of mine. Like, he's a, you know, he, um, he's a, he's a good guy. Um, I, I think he says things that are like incredibly offensive. Um, but, um. But he's a, you know, I think he's genuinely a good guy who believes in his country. But like, you know, you think he's evolved I, I think, throughout the let's years. Let's just say, I think it's time for a new generation of leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's just, it's time for the generation that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan to step in for the generation that sent us there. I, I think it's time for the generation that's got to deal with like climate change and the changing economy to to step in for the generation that got us here. Like, it's time for some new ideas here, folks. Some new blood. You know, but who's who's, blood. In, who's in better shape moving forward, Democrats or Republicans? Because I'm. It seems like both parties are all over the place right now. Well, I think both parties are all over the place right now. And we have a we have a chance in 2020 to show what kind of nation we really are. Like this election is about a lot of things, healthcare, climate, economy and everything, but like most of all it's about our values, like who we are as a country. You know, are, are we going to follow Donald Trump's um, you know, narcissistic values or are we going to be the country that actually lives up to these promises that we made in our constitution? Like that's what this election is about. But you know what? It's one thing in 2020. It's really about what we do in 2021, because we can make all these promises, including some of the ones we've talked about, you know, free college, all this stuff. But if we don't do anything, then people are going to look at us and be like, well, Democrats, you know, you made all these promises and didn't didn't follow through. Right. So, look, we got a lot of work to do. And and I've been working very hard um, to not just, you know, uh, do my job as a congressman, but get other people in the politics, get new people in the politics. I supported a whole bunch of veterans who ran to help flip the House this past year. Um, had a huge impact on House races. About about half the seats that we flipped to take back the House were, were candidates I supported. And um, and they're going to make a difference. But the point is, you know, we just need to get some new blood. Yeah, I just want I just want Democrats to finally stand up to Trump, man. There come a point in time where you got to stand up to the bully. Even if you just get the impeachment proceedings going. Not saying he'll get impeached, but you have to set a precedent that this behavior is not what we will tolerate from presidency of the United States of America. I cannot tell you how right you are. So I was actually the first candidate in this whole field out of 23 or whatever it is now running that called for impeachment. Because you know what? I get the fact that the politics might be tricky. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, Pelosi makes a good case that the politics are tricky on this. But what about the principle? Like, what about the fact that, like, this guy broke the law? Mm. Like, I'm sorry, but the the rule is in the United States, you break the law, there's consequences. He lies and breaks the law all the time. Bill Clinton got some head in the 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 White House, 
and lied because he's married and and they and he, started the impeachment proceedings against him like jesus yeah Christ. but but obstructing justice like oh okay fine we'll just let you get away with absolutely it. This is a lot that's ridiculous well, well how can people than. find you online seth so that they can donate to your campaign learn more about you well thank you seth molten.com that's s-e-t-h-m-o-u-l-t-o-n.com uh go on there check out what i'm about mm-hmm. you know um read my policies read my positions but but most of all i hope you just see that you know I'm a veteran, I'm a young father, I'm someone that you may not agree with me on every issue, but you're, I'm someone you can trust. Like, I'm always gonna tell you where I stand, um, I'm gonna be honest, and that's the kind of leadership we need in the Marines, that's the kind of leadership I think we need for the next president of the United States. What about the GoFundMe for your student loans? You have something set up for that? No, no. <laughs> I'll you be want, okay. You don't wanna throw that out there? All right. <laughs> Seth, we appreciate you for joining us. Hey, thank uh, you very you're, much. You're a Patriots fan? Look, of course I am. I told you I'm going to be honest, you know? You didn't know how to answer that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Sox, too, you know. Oh, man. Bruins, Celtics. Oh, I mean, you know. Man. You have no choice. <laughs> You're from Massachusetts, right? Do you honestly think I'd get elected if I wasn't? But no, I'm, I've always been a, been a Pats fan. Mm-hmm. always been a Sox fan. Okay. Um, that's just, you know, that's who I am. All right. Well, it's Seth Moulton. <laughs> it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning.